Hello and welcome to Amar Woman Magazine. I'm your host, Wendy Brawley. I am joined today again by our lovely co-host, Ms. Jessica Martinez. Hey. And Dr. Marcia Brevard Wynn. So, Dr. Marcia Brevard Wynn, what's our first topic today? Well, since the last time we were together, some incidents have happened in our nation. For instance, we were reminded how vulnerable our nation actually is with the events at the Boston Marathon. Uh, the bombings that happened there, and I'm sure by now you've read the news and heard all the uh, read the media. All the every day they're still talking about it now. For instance, by now you know that a young boy was killed. Mm -hmm. By now you know that some innocent bystanders were killed. So Boston happened to all of us in some way, whether we were actually at the marathon or not. And those of us who heard the news, of course, we were shocked and devastated by what went on. The dismembered bodies and some of the other horrific things that they showed on the news just brought to light just what a position our nation is in since 9-11. And um, for all the evil that is actually out there in spite of those events, there was actually a lot of goodness that was shown in those events. Um, for instance, there were some ordinary people who just jumped into action to help those who were injured just all of a sudden right before their eyes on the street. For, so for that instant, just like with 9-11, we became united as a nation for a moment. Right now that's still going on. For nine, it wasn't like the 9-11 that, that United Front lasted for a, a, a decent amount of time because that was a larger event. But now you wonder, we're united now, but where do we go from here? What has that done to us emotionally and psychologically? Where do we go? You're, you're attending an event, uh, perhaps to participate or to cheer someone on. This happens. How do you go about your daily life after this? Do we become paranoid as a nation when we in large events at a football game, at a concert, you see someone with a backpack and they put it down. Mm -hmm. What do we do? We become fearful? Do we become a nation living in fear? Or how do we function from this point forward in lieu of those events? Well, I mean, you know, for me, I mean, it's, it's a sad commentary that young people, somebody as young as they were, who were really kind of almost, if you brought up like everyday American citizens would have that kind of feeling toward other human beings and to do that kind of devastating thing, not to just the people who were injured, but to all of their families and everybody who watched in horror. But I, I, the American people are resilient, you know. I, I just believe that we have the ability to come back even from horrible situations like this. And even though we may not get to where we want, where we have this utopia, you know, where we are working together, I do think that, you know, we're not going to let an incident like this or 9-11 or whatever's out there to come keep us from living the freedom that we, we love in this country. That's, that's just the way I feel. I mean, I'd be cautious now. I'm going to be looking. <laughs> but there even so, what are you looking for? There are, some people are going to begin to stereotype that particular ethnicity. People well, no, I mean, I, I won't. But, I mean, because I know what the stereotyping is like for people. I've been stereotyped. And, I'm, I mean, I'm looking for bags and bombs <laughs> and things yeah. like that. You know, I'm not looking Does that make people. you paranoid, though? Are you going to walk around looking for those bags? I don't think so. I, I, I I think we all need to. I really do, given the world that we live in. I was reading uh, some of the comments, like on YouTube and also the um, uh, from the newspaper, um, you know, online. And there, were, there seems to be a lot of hatred towards Muslims. Mm -hmm. And we need to keep in mind that this is just a select group that we shouldn't generalize this for all I, I, I think I, I can agree with that. I mean, I think any any rational person could agree that we shouldn't make a stereotypical uh, assumption about a whole ethnic group of people because of the actions of a few people, even um, a sect of people. But, be, but we do have to, as a nation, we have to be cautious. We have to exercise good judgment. And we have to still be a nation of laws. Despite everything, I like what the president said. He said, we are not victims. Right. And we cannot go around hating people just because they're Muslims. Not all Muslims right. are like that. It's I do think that most people, there are some people who are going to look at 
it the way that you're probably thinking that some people will say, oh, all Muslims are responsible for this. We ought to have stricter laws against Muslims. But, you know, that is a mistake to do that. And yes. I think because we live in a country like America where our borders are somewhat degree open to all immigrants, then we can't make those generalizations. We just have to be careful. This is a different world that we live in than the world that our parents grew up in. So we have to be cautious because there are some people who hate America. Not necessarily Americans, but hate the America and what it represents. But we don't have to inflict those prejudices on a whole race of people. I just think that would be wrong. It seems like the more America tries to thrive and grow, you're always going to have an enemy, so to speak, who's going to come in and try right. to destroy right. that. That's true of anything. I mean, if you're trying to do something positive and good, you have your naysayers that are going to try to, you know, detract from your ability to be successful, to be who you are, to be what you want to do and do positive things. So I, I think we're bigger than that as a nation. I mean, there are some small-minded people in some pretty high places, mm -hmm. but I think as a whole, we're, we're bigger than that. Well, thank you, Dr. Lynn. Very good topic. Um, but we've got an even juicier one coming up. So after the break, we're going to talk about another hot topic, infidelity. So stay with us. We'll be right back. It's a change of focus from a patient doctor to more of a team-based approach. They have really worked as a team just to help me as a patient. I have to do my part, but I got some of this patting me on the shoulder that says, okay, let's go. Let's go a little farther. And if they do that to me, I can imagine what they do with others. I'm very happy to know that somebody else cares about what I'm feeling and how I'm feeling. Get the whole story at a healthysc.tv, Blue Cross Blue Shield of South Carolina, because it matters how you're treated. Welcome back. Thanks for staying with us. Well, we promised you that this would be an interesting segment. We are just delighted to have joining us for this segment Dr. Tanya Dillahay. And Dr. Dillahay is a psychiatrist. And she's here to talk about a very interesting topic that generated a lot of conversation in our publication, Amara. You wrote an article, Dr. Dillahay, on cheaters. <laughs> uh, cheating in a relationship. And, you know, before we get into the psychology of it all, I just would like for us to talk a little bit about what do we feel about cheating in a relationship? I mean, do we think, as women in particular, that that's to be expected? Or is it something that we ought not expect? Well, it shouldn't be expected and, in my opinion, shouldn't be tolerated. Mm, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty concise. <laughs> No, I don't think anyone should go into a marriage expecting to be cheated on. That's the wrong mindset. And if you expect that going in, why are you doing it in the first place? Don't bother doing it if you know that perhaps you're going to be cheated on one day. I think that catches you quite unexpectedly in a marriage. Yeah. And should not be tolerated. Well, I think a lot of times um, people just accept that. And it's not saying that you know, your mate may not make a mistake or you may not make a mistake, but it's just continuing to do it and just say, well, you know, that's how men are or, you know, I have to deal with it. No, you don't. Well, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Dillahay, is that just how men are? They're just cheaters by nature? <laughs> I, I agree. I think we shouldn't tolerate that. And I think recently in the media we've seen many cases of infidelity, uh, quite public cases. And um, what we wanted to do in writing the article was to say to wives that you can recover from infidelity, that a marriage can survive if both parties are willing to work at it. Won't be easy, but it can happen. Yeah, if both. If both yeah. parties. Yeah, that's the qualifier, huh? If both parties. It is, because if if the man is just going to continue, or the woman is going to just continue to cheat, then you don't need to be married. You need to be by yourself, enjoying everybody. <laughs> enjoying everybody. <laughs> I don't think it's even about serial cheaters. It could take one incident to throw the marriage off kilter. It depends on how strong your union was prior to that incident happening. It's not necessarily a repeat offender. Everybody can change. Everybody's human. I mean, men are fallible in that sense, just like women are. But it's how, how strong was the foundation of the marriage before that cheating incident happened. I think that's what's important. 
and whether I think you whether, raised the question standard. whether it's worth saving. Whether you have to figure it out where whether was your it's marriage worth prior saving. to yeah. that. How do you do that, Dr. Dillon? Well, I remember a case um, in which this lady was a stay-at-home mom, and um, she found out that her husband was cheating, and she said she was totally blindsided by it. She had two children, had no idea, was devastated, huh. absolutely devastated. And she went through a lot of the typical reactions that you would go through when you're shocked. I mean, there was depression, anxiety, trouble sleeping, loss of appetite, huh. um, and... Uh, during that time, it's really hard to make that decision as to whether you want to stay. This is when you need help, professional help, whether it's from your minister or a counselor, but someone that can help you pull back and, and get a perspective on making that decision. And only the couple can make that decision. Right. Well, if you're in a situation where one spouse, i.e. the non-cheater, <laughs> is willing to try to go and get counseling, but the other spouse, the cheater, is unwilling, is that a red flag that maybe this is one that won't work? Exactly. I think that is a red flag. I mean, if the cheater says that this woman is his soulmate, then mm. it's <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> if he says he's remorseful, he wants to save his family, he'll do whatever is necessary to save the family, and they can go to counseling and work those things out, then I think it's it's worth trying to preserve the family. I've read a lot yeah. sometimes where marriages grew stronger because they did do mm. some kind of counseling when they really found out what the core issue was because it goes be beyond just that, that fling or one night stand or whatever the case is. There's a core issue deeper than that and any woman who says she was just blindsided by that, I don't think that's true either. There are some red flags that were overlooked along the mm. way. There are always little signs, I think, if you truly know your mate. It didn't just happen overnight. Just like the problems, the core issue didn't happen overnight. But how do you how do you get over? I mean, you know that's that's nice, y'all. But mm -hmm. how, I mean, I would. How do you get over the anger? Mm -hmm. I mean, you you just mad. I mean, and well, a I lot think. of people say. I mean, that's how a lot of this violence mm -hmm. takes place. And mm -hmm. then a lot of people say, well, you know what? They ain't the only one that can cheat. Mm -hmm. And they go out and they get involved in something right. just to. Fling just because I mean how do you I think we're how do you get that you're just making <laughs> adding more <laughs> cheating. <laughs> it's it's in that sense. cheating. That's well, I, I think in, in this particular case and I'll change things up so that it um it of course doesn't identify anything, but what she needed to move forward was she needed to know that he was gonna stop the affair immediately. Mm -hmm. They were tested for STDs, mm -hmm. uh, they went through counseling. Um, one of the things that she really needed, if you want to look at it as revenge, is she wanted to listen in on the conversation of him telling the other woman, this it's was over. a mistake, <laughs> it's over, mm -hmm. you know, I'm staying with my family. So mm -hmm. maybe that's what that particular person needed in order to move forward. But you know, um, sometimes we look at the woman like, okay, she's the dirty, <laughs> woman, the, the home wrecker, <laughs> yeah, the whore, but really, it's really his responsibility to be committed. It was his responsibility. I'm not saying that there's, there are those women that, um, that's their specialty, <laughs> and that's horrible, but it is his responsibility to be committed. I think in that sense, it, it, there are always two sides to the story. Mm -hmm. You don't know what that other woman has been told. There's mm. trouble at home. Exactly. I'm divorced. Yeah. I'm yeah. separated. Exactly. And a lot of so times you know, that's what they say. They always yeah. blame her. Exactly. She's basing it on information she was given. So when wives get mad at the other woman, I think you need to hear both sides of the story. What has that other woman been told? She'd be totally innocent in exactly. that because based on what exactly. she's been told. So she's not always mm -hmm. the bad guy in it. Yeah. That's well, listen, hold all these thoughts. Dr. Dilhay, can you stay with us a few more minutes for our next segment? Okay, well, we will be right back, so stay with us. We all have something neatly tucked away in the back of our mind. A secret hope. That thing we've always wanted to do. It's not about having dreams. It's about reaching them. Ally for Real Possibilities, AARP. Find tools and direction at aarp.org slash possibilities.
Do you think that people are prone to cheat at some point in their relationship? Well, in my experience, it's more prevalent now than perhaps in our parents' day. Who do you think cheat more, men or women? Men. Thanks for staying with us and welcome back. Well, to say we've got an interesting topic would be quite of an understatement. Uh, we are talking about infidelity today, this Sunday morning. <laughs> we are talking about cheating. Uh, but we, you know, we wanna we wanna be fair in our discussion because we are a panel of women, mm -hmm. and we've heard from, uh, you know, our uh, uh, an outside person to talk about this issue. Also, a woman. Um, but there is another side to the issue, and you talked a little bit about that, Dr. Dill Hay, um, in the in your article. You talked about um, why men may cheat. Um, and what they're looking for. Can you tell, talk a little more about that? Just purely the sex uh, as to why men cheat. Um, probably there's some insecurities in them that they're trying to fill. And whether this other person boosts the ego or there's excitement, whereas at home there may be bad report cards and late bills. <laughs> so there's yeah. not much excitement at home all the time. So um, I think there are a variety of reasons. That, that men cheat. You know, we had this conversation um, just talking about this topic before you wrote it, and then it has generated so much interest. It's been a, a case study at a women's conference as a result of this article. But um, a lot of it was that sometimes it's harder for the woman when the cheating relationship is not a sexual one when their spouse or their significant other is having a relationship emotionally mm -hmm. with another person and it's not a sexual relationship, that sometimes can be harder for a woman to get over than just a fling. Is, what, what do hey, y'all like? <laughs> If it's an emotional affair, I think the other woman has touched his heart, and mm -hmm. that's beyond that's the soulmate. That's, 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 that's soulmate that's status, right. and that that can then lead to a physical thing. But when she gets his heart, that that's far deeper. That's that's mm -hmm. a deeper wound to deal with. Mm -hmm. And you know what I um, like to say to the other woman who may be involved is that you know if this man really cares for you then he will make steps, not in a cheating sort of way, um, but he will make steps to make the relationship with you an appropriate relationship, whether that's asking for a divorce or whatever he needs to do to make it above board and mm -hmm. not hurt so many different people. At the same time, if he's not willing to do that, he's blocking you from uh, meeting that guy that God has out there for you. Mm -hmm. And you may be missing out on your blessing so waiting for someone who mm -hmm. has no intention of leaving his family. That's an interesting point. And I think a lot of times when that happens, that's when you really have situations of conflict and violence and mm -hmm. all kind. you know, you know, women showing up at your job, and <laughs> exactly. women calling the house. I mean, it can get really ugly. I've heard really bad situations. Um, so how, I know you talked about a lot of practical things that couples can do, mm -hmm. uh, particularly women when they're dealing emotionally, um, to kind of pull back emotionally and look at some practical things. You were real practical. <laughs> you said, you know, think about the separation of property, think about settlement of debt, think about custody of children, think about money. Think about the wealth that you've accumulated. And as I read that, I thought, hmm, that's a matter of fact. But but it really is important to think about those things. Mm -hmm. So can you kind of tell us why? Well, again, this article was written towards the wives involved in a situation. And, and you know, we've had a couple of cases where, like Hillary Clinton, for mm -hmm. instance, and mm -hmm. she was criticized. But she made a decision she thought was appropriate for her. And you do have to think a marriage is more than a couple. It's the children, it's the in-laws, it's friends, it's church members. And then as a family, you do have home ownership, child custody, insurance. There's a lot of things that's involved in a marriage that um, the wife needs to think about in making her decision to try to put some perspective in, into it. It's not just emotional. No, and I can appreciate what you're saying, but at the end of the day, 
if your husband is just going to totally disrespect you, or it could be a wife, just completely disregard your feelings and um, not really care about the marriage, then all the money in the world is not going to... He got to go. Yeah. It's, it's not going to make you happy. And here again, the article was written for yeah. men who want to save their marriages oh, yeah, men, yeah. and their wives. Now, of course, if he's going to continue to right, do that, right, right. you have to worry about your health, sexually transmitted diseases. Absolutely. What do you, you think about, about the violence? trust factor in that? When people, I find it hard to believe when someone that close to you betrays a trust, and some women are able to rebuild some semblance of trust, but I think you'd be a fool to trust that same individual 100% ever again. I think you can rebuild it to a certain extent, but what does, the, what does that do for the marriage? It, when it, that trust is like torn down to Right, level? it's a process, and I think that counseling for one will help both of them put in perspective what went wrong and the trust and forgiveness will take time. That won't happen overnight. Mm -hmm. Now, some of the things we suggest is, um, again, the affair has to stop immediately. The wife needs passwords to all Ooh. email, that's all right. cell phones. That's right. <laughs> if, you, if I call and you don't answer, mm -hmm. we have a problem. If that's you're gonna right. be late at work, you need to call. There are things that only the wife can say what she needs to rebuild that trust and to, and to get forgiveness. It's a long road. It's not easy. Mm -hmm. And you need help. That's a good point. Well, Dr. Dill, hey, this is a tough subject. I think it you is. have enlightened us <laughs> all. Um, and you have really stirred up a lot of good conversation. And we are just so delighted you were able to join us today. Well, we hope we can help families. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. this, this I, You know, I, and I say this honestly, a lot of women have no idea. They have no idea, and they don't even know uh, it could possibly happen to them in their relationship. So, you know, having a discussion and talking about it before something bad happens so that you recognize the signs is so important. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Well, coming up next, we're going to go to a much lighter topic, <laughs> and we're going to talk about uh, a local, but actually a foundation from Philadelphia that's doing a lot of good things in South Carolina, and we're going to introduce you to the president of that foundation and tell you about some of the things you have to look forward to in the coming months. So stay with us. We'll be right back. Thanks for staying with us. Well, I am delighted to have in studio with me today, Maria Pahil Battle. Maria is all the way here from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Maria, thank you so much, first of all, for joining us today. It's really my honor to be here. I'm really very happy and delighted to share some time with you. Oh, good, good. Well, Maria, you are the president of the AmeriHealth Mercy Foundation. Mm -hmm. And before we get into, you know, some of the things that you all are doing, can you tell us, tell our viewers, what is the AmeriHealth Mercy Foundation? Well, we are a nonprofit, uh, educational and charitable organization that actually uh, provides programs in the community, health programs in the community, health education, both prevention and intervention education. And we're doing this in 14 states currently. Uh, the Murray Health Family of Companies has uh, spread its, its wings. Mm -hmm. And so they formed this foundation, this nonprofit, really, to be able to go out and spread the mission among more than just their members, but their communities at large. Which is a great segue into the project that you and your organization and Amara uh, Community Foundation and Amara Woman Magazine have worked on together with Select Health and First Choice. And, and it's our Health Ministry Empowerment Tour. And I, I mean, that's just an incredible event. Every fall, we have women in rural parts of South Carolina who get to come out for a wonderful day, as you say, of health education. That's right. That's correct. And, and, and it's very exciting to know that you have been working with Select Health, which is one of the um, managed care companies of the Emory Health Family of Companies. And you've been with them for 10, 12 years? Uh, uh, tw about 12, 12 years, years now. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and of course, <laughs> our, our program, the, um, the Emory Health uh, Foundation, is only two years. 
And so uh, we have transferred, the corporation transferred the um, health ministry program, the faith-based initiative, to, uh, to the foundation for the purposes of going out to all the communities. And you've been doing this for so long. And I'm just excited to really work with you and really expand the program yeah. to even more than what, it, what, what you have been doing. It's been wonderful. Uh, but I think there's even more opportunities. And that's what it's exciting for us, just getting that those fresh ideas. We have been doing this now. This is our 12th year. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've been in 40 or 46 mm -hmm. of the counties. And, you know, it, it's a challenge to keep it fresh and keep it new. But you've already brought some great <laughs> ideas for uh, for us this fall. You want to share a few? <laughs> <laughs> I think so. I think it's really exciting. I know that uh, we're going to be doing some vignettes. Uh, we'll probably have some professional actors talking about generational issues, um, you know, how stress and depression can trigger chronic disease, yes. and especially if it's in the family, a grandmom, a daughter, granddaughter, and all of the different intricacies that can happen, and how it can make your blood pressure boil and your sugar go up, mm -hmm. and, and so we need to learn how to uh, do those things, and, and then a lot of times people don't even take their medication right. So we've got this piece that we're going to bring. We have a special skills life coach that works with us often, uh, actor Alan Payne. Okay. And we hope to bring him also. Wow, the ladies will love that. <laughs> yeah. but, you know, they really do, but he has such a wonderful message about wellness, about healthy living styles. And, and people tend to learn uh, from people that you know that they look up to right. and, and they think that wow if they can do it I so, can do it. well I think that um, I just finished the 40-day journey in Philadelphia which was uh, right before Lent and we had such wonderful outcomes because we get to see the people every week for six weeks mm. and it really makes a difference if Absolutely. you can do that but with the programs that we're having here even though we get we only get a chance in the rural counties to see them once you just never know how you can change that one person's yeah. life. Yeah, and I think the fact that we're connecting it to the faith-based initiatives in their communities, if you can touch people emotionally, that's where change happens. That's right. That's where change happens. Well, Maria, thank you so, so much for all that you're doing here in South Carolina and for being with us today. Well, that completes our show today. We hope that you enjoyed it and that you learned something that both inspires and empowers you. Remember, you can check out any of the topics we've covered on today's show in a Mar Woman magazine. And you can also check out this show on YouTube. You can also read a Mar Woman online in our e-magazine. Don't forget to like a Mar Woman magazine on Facebook. And button follow a Mar Woman magazine on Twitter. So, until the next time, peace.